Over the last number of weeks, uh, we have been studying the Old Testament book of Ezra and the theme of rebuild. Ezra is all about the return of the Jews to their homeland and the rebuilding of their temple and reestablishing personal and corporate worship after 70 years of exile uh, to Babylon. We're studying Ezra to grow in our appreciation of how God has been moving through history to accomplish his redeeming plan. By better understanding what he has done through history, this helps us grow in our confidence of him and his faithfulness to us and what he is doing in our day and his plan for the future. Ezra chapter 1 and 2 was all about setting the stage, setting the table. And we see, see, uh, saw how God provides the time, the leadership, and the resources for the rebuild. Last week we learned in chapter 3 that rebuild, uh, rebuilding begins at the altar of the heart and in corporate worship. Rebuilding begins at the altar of our hearts and in corporate worship. We saw the rebuilding of the altar in the temple as smoke once again began to rise towards heaven after decades of lying dormant. Daily sacrifices were reinstituted. Hearts were laid bare before God. Devotion and worship to God was reestablished as the center of the people's hearts. They built an altar first because it was an expression of crying out in dependence to God to save and protect and provide for them. Their enemies who had lived around them were not pleased that they had moved back, and their enemies wanted to exterminate them. Yet in spite of the fear of their enemies, they built that altar and laid the foundation of the temple where God would dwell. Well, I invite you now to turn to Ezra chapter 4. That's where we're going to be at today for the next few minutes, Ezra chapter 4. And uh, Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 says, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for Yahweh, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the leaders and families and said to them, Let us build with you, for we also worship your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of King Esser Haddon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Joshua... And the other leaders of Israel's families answered them, you may have no part with us in building a house for God since we alone must build it for Yahweh, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. When the enemies that we see in chapter 3 learned of the exile's intentions, they approached the leadership and said, hey, we want to build with you. We worship the God that you do. And Zerubbabel and Joshua and, and the other leadership give this rather stark, harsh answer. No, we don't want you to be a part of this. Well, the people that were surrounding Israel worshipped all sorts of gods and religions and cultures and placed the God of the Jews as one of the many. Like our world today, you can worship Jesus and God as long as he falls in line with everyone else. You dare not ex uh, claim exclusive rights or supremacy because there is no one truth, so the world says then. And as the world says now, there is no one truth. Well, Je uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, they knew that these enemies were trying to discourage and rebuild from the inside. They knew that these Surrounding peoples were trying to dilute and discourage the rebuild. They were trying to infiltrate from the inside. But the leaders drew a hard line and said, no, you will have no part of us. And so the enemies tried another tactic. Verse 4. They tried to discourage from the outside. Then the people who were already in the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. They also hired bribed officials to act against them to frustrate their plans throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia until the reign of King Darius of Persia. The word discourage here, it means to sink. It means to let drop or dishearten. Their goal was to pull them under the water. If you see someone flailing around in the water, they can't swim. They're going down. They're going to drown. They cannot keep their head above the water. What would be your first reaction? Probably to throw them something that can float. 
Well, the enemies were intent on holding them under the water. They wanted them to sink, and they wanted them to drown. They wanted to discourage them, and that's what the word discouragement means there. The people in the land wanted the Jews to sink and made them afraid to build. Well, the world does not want the church to float. Or the world does not want the church to grow. The world, the flesh, and the devil are trying to force the church underwater. Well, the enemies also hired lobbyists. They also hired experts and counselors and advisors to frustrate, to break them, to make them ineffective. They hired these experts. They bribed officials to get into the minds of the people. Jump down to verse 24. It mirrors verse 5. Now the construction of God's house in Jerusalem had stopped and remained at a standstill until the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. This policy of harassment, this policy of harassment continued until the time of the reign of Darius, which started in 521. All of this discouragement, all of this external frustration and meanness and constant badgering of ag- aggression and personal discouragement went on for 22 years. The opposition succeeded. We see that the time of the building began in chapter 3. But it doesn't pick up until chapter 5. And in between the end of chapter 3, throughout chapter 4, and into chapter 5, is 16 to 18 years. That little quarter inch of white space in your Bibles between chapter 4 and chapter 5 is 16 to 18 years. And that mentality of discouragement and infiltration and discouragement and aggression went on for many, many years. Have you ever been discouraged for one year? <laughs> Just, you know, this was a really hard year. Have you ever been discouraged for two years? Have you ever been discouraged for 15 years, 16 years, 20 years? Their discouragement and fear was long and oppressive and ongoing. Verse 6 through 23 takes us to a different timeline. Commentator Roberts suggests that one of the reasons for this additional commentary of another period was to illustrate the kind of opposition that occurred while Cyrus and Darius ruled. Ezra chapter 4, verse 6. At the beginning of the reign of Asuras, the people who were already in the land wrote an accusation against the residents of Judah and Jerusalem. And during the time of the king of Artaxerxes of Persia, Bishlam, Mithridef, and Tabel, and the rest of his colleagues wrote to King Artaxerxes. Asherus is better known in its Greek form to us as Xerxes or Artaxerxes I. And uh, verses 6 through 23 probably occurred between 465 B.C. and 423 B.C., during that time which Artaxerxes ruled the Persian Empire. And they wrote this letter of, of accusation to the people in this time. And Ezra, in verses six, or 8 to, and 9, gives this impressive list of all the government officials that, had, uh, that, that are coming against Judah and Jerusalem. It's like the United Nations rising up against Israel and saying, Israel, you cannot exist and establish yourself. You cannot build on your land. You cannot protect your interests or pursue the kind of life or values that are important to you. You have no rights. In verse 12, the city and its people are called rebellious and evil by the state. How would you feel if the government said you are rebellious and evil? How would you feel if the state government said, Emmanuel, you are rebellious and evil? 
Obviously, we're not at that point. But should the state and government call Christians and Christ's church rebellious and evil, how would we respond? That's what's happening here in the Old Testament. The state has risen up against God's people and said, you are rebellious and evil. Well, rebuilding will always face opposition. Anytime a Christian or the church asserts the worship of Jesus Christ as the number one priority, there will be opposition. Anytime the church or a Christian asserts the supremacy of Jesus Christ and the worship of Jesus Christ, anytime the Christian or the church asserts the worship and the supremacy of Jesus Christ, there will be opposition. As sure as the sun rises, there has always been opposition to a move, to a fresh move of God and his redeeming humanity. In response to the letter from the regional officials we see in verses 17 to 24, King Artaxerxes sends a letter. And he says, you know, in response to the letter that you guys sent to me, I'm sending a response back to you. And this is my response. After looking at the royal archives, I see that indeed these people are rebellious, difficult to deal with uh, in that region. So I'm, I'm telling you, I need you to go and tell these people to stop work. Stop immediately. Don't neglect this. Be on top of it. Otherwise, my best interests are going to be at risk. I need you to take care of this and take care of it now. So there's a sense of urgency coming from King Artaxerxes to the regional government. Verse 23, as soon as the text of King Artaxerxes' letter was read to Rehum, Sishim, the scribe and their colleagues, they immediately went to the Jews in Jerusalem and forcibly stopped them. As soon as the letter came from King Artaxerxes, uh, they read the letter and an entourage of inflated high officials immediately went to the Jews, waving the king's letter in their faces. And this word here, uh, forcibly, means army. The army was brought in. The military was brought to bear on the people. We don't know, uh, there, but there may have been swords and spears. There may have been some punches thrown. There may have been, been a little bit of blood spilt. But we know that there was force exerted against the Jews to stand down. And there must have been ongoing policing in this time, enforcement. How long did that enforcement of the state go on? A couple months, a couple years, 10 years, 15 years? We don't know, but there was government overstep, and there was probably policing to halt the building of the temple. But an interesting thing happened. Over time, the people in Jerusalem just came to accept the fact that, okay, we... We can't build a temple. What else can we do? Oh, I know. Let's build our houses. So for 16 to 18 years that passes between Ezra chapter 4 and Ezra chapter 5, that quarter inch, they turned their attention to building their houses. Enter Ezra chapter 5. And that's where Haggai and Zechariah fit in. And we'll get into that next week. But again, between chapter 4 and chapter 5 is 16 to 18 years. The foundation that the temple that they laid, that they were so excited about, that they shouted and they heard from far away the worship and the celebration of the building of this new temple and the foundation that was laid. That foundation, after 16 to 18 years of neglect, what happened? Perhaps it got lost in overgrowth. Perhaps weeds started to grow through the parking lot. Perhaps animals moved in. They had laid the foundation. But over that period of time, they gave up. End chapter 4. Next week we'll look at chapter 5. As we end the chapter 4, here's some ideas uh, or some observations uh, that I think apply. Now, the big idea is this, when rebuilding, the church will face opposition from the outside, the inside, and from ourselves. 
when rebuilding the church, we will face opposition from the outside, from the inside, and from ourselves. A couple of brief, brief observations. We will face opposition from the outside, the world. We will encounter opposition. Why did the enemies the Jew, oppose the Jews? Because they symbolized what God was doing in their midst. The Jews worshiped the one true God and the supremacy of Yahweh. Zerubbabel and Yeshua said, no, you do not worship the same God that we do. You can have no part of us. You worship all the same gods. The Jews were on a mission to reestablish the supremacy of Yahweh in that area. And as I said previously, when the church sets her foot on the supremacy and the worship of Jesus Christ and his word, there will be opposition in our world of pluralism and synchronicity. There will be opposition. 2 Timothy 3, 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ, you're going to see it. While evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul promises Timothy, who is just relaying information that Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jim Caviezel, whose initials are JC, was 33 when he played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ. And Caviezel said his faith is his guide both personally and professionally and that God called him to the acting profession. Before casting the actor to play Jesus, Mel Gibson uh, told the up-and-coming actor that the role might cost him his career. But Caviezel, a, a confessing Christian, wanted to honor his Lord by portraying the life and death of Christ. And Caviezel responded to Gibson, we all have a cross to carry. I have to carry my own cross. If I don't carry my own cross, I'll be crushed under the weight of it. As it turned out, Caviezel's decision to carry the cross of Christ has definitely cost him career opportunities. Caviezel said he doesn't worry about the career price he paid with that film, a global box office smash that led to fewer, not more, offers to him. The awards, the Hall of Fame, the actor said here on earth, he said don't matter to him. His reward, he said, will come to heaven. Caviezel said, Jesus is, a, is as controversial now as he was then. When we rebuild the church or build the church, we will face opposition from the outside. We'll also face opposition from the inside. James says uh, in 4 1, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Why are you guys fighting? Why on the inside is there this bickering? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Uh, unity, as we know, is a primary value that is asserted in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, both by Jesus and the apostles. And if the devil can cause disunity, he neutralizes the church and causes us to waste time on piddly, piddly little things and not attending to the flock and the mission of the church. We simply cannot worship Jesus Christ when we're fighting with each other. We cannot feed our souls and care for others when we're self-absorbed in our own preferences. We will not have his vision. We will not have his passion or energy to reach out if we're exhausted from battling ourselves. So there will be opposition coming from the inside to building God's kingdom building Christ's church. Lastly, we'll be, when we rebuild, we'll be finding opposition from ourselves. We cannot be thinking about Christ's mission and the building of his church, his kingdom on earth, if we're given to sin or we're too lazy or we're too busy. If I'm self, uh, selfish and, and swallowed by my pride, I will not love and live and die like Christ. My flesh wants comfort, not faith. And our culture revolves around satisfying our flesh in the quickest and cheapest way. My flesh, your flesh, is at war with God. 
Paul says in Colossians 3, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk this way, you used to live this way in the life you once lived, but now you, you got to get rid of this stuff. Things like these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. This is what is in our heart. Every single one of us. And what we bring to the rebuild if the Holy Spirit is not in control of our lives. If we are not submitted to the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ, uh, the rebuilding of this church, uh, this is what we bring to the table. Well, ultimately, uh, all opposition to the work of God and the advancement of Christ's kingdom on earth is a spiritual battle that has been since the beginning of time. There's only two kingdoms. God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. The kingdom of Christ and of our Lord and the kingdom of the deceiver who has taken people captive to do his will, whether it is opposition to God from the outside or the inside of the church or the inside of our own hearts, there is a daily battle going on for the glory of Jesus Christ and for his church. But the hope that we have is when the times will have reached their fulfillment, Christ will destroy the evil one and his work with the breath of his mouth. When the time is done and Jesus says, we're done. He will destroy the evil one and all his work by breathing on him. No contest. Christian, there are many battles. But the war has been won on the cross when Jesus died and rose from the dead. Killing death, fulfilling the law, washing our sins away and setting us free. There will be battles and there are battles, but the war has been won. Paul says in Ephesians 6, he reminds us of this battle from which opposition comes. Opposition from the outside, the inside, and ourselves. Paul says this, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Why? Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Why? So that when the day of evil comes, so that when the day of opposition comes, You may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. 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 Christian, there is victory. There is victory in Jesus Christ. Challenge and suffering and opposition are sure to come for those on the receiving end of opposition and pursuing the building of Christ's church. One can get frustrated and angry and impatient. Or we can fight the opposition, trusting the Holy Spirit who is at work, causing all things to work together for the good of those who love him. We can get impatient, or we can trust. We can push, or we can pray. A couple of things to take home. Consider doing a Bible study on persecution. Again, as I said, whenever the church or an individual sets their foot on the supremacy and the worship of Jesus Christ as the soul of their heart and purpose on life, you will face opposition. The American church has not experienced persecution like the rest of the world. We just have not. But are you ready? And this passage encourages us to be prepared and to think how will we respond when the enemy wants to push us under the water. How will you respond? The Bible teaches us how we ought to respond. Consider doing a Bible study in persecution. Like Zerubbabel and Joshua, can you articulate how the world is trying to infiltrate you? 
or pull the church under the water? Can you say, you know, I see this opposition. I think in our culture, we don't like to talk about opposition. We think everybody's neutral. That's not true. We're to love and die as Christ did. However, there is opposition. And when we're living a spirit-filled life, resembling mirroring Christ, we will face opposition. Can you articulate who or where that uh, uh, opposition is coming from? Who are the hired experts in your life? You know, when they couldn't, in uh, Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the leaders, when, when they couldn't infiltrate, they discouraged, but they also hired external, they bribed officials to come in and speak against. Are there people in your life who are hired experts that are trying to discourage your faithfulness to Christ? Who are those people? You've loved them, you've encouraged them, you pray for them. We're called to pray for those who don't like us, who are against us. We're called to pray for them. But if we can't articulate who those people are, how we respond to them may not be Christ-like. But we need to be aware of who these paid experts are so that we can come to them as Christ would have us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Who are those hired experts in your life? Are you encouraging or discouraging the leadership of the church? Opposition comes from the outside, comes from the inside. Are you encouraging or discouraging the leadership of the church? Do you want to help the church build? Are you neutral or are you trying to tear it apart? Do you want to help the rebuild? Are you neutral? I, I just don't care. Or are you against? Where do you stand on the next generation of Emmanuel? And then lastly, uh, does the Holy Spirit truly have victory in your heart and in your mind? Does the Holy Spirit really control where you spend your time, how you give your energy to particular things? Is he really the one that breathes that wind into your life and guides and directs your decisions, how you respond, how you react to life, how you engage with people or conflict? Opposition comes from the outside, comes from the inside, comes from within. And it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, submitted to him in humility, that we give ourselves to our Lord, to our brothers and sisters, and to the world. The Holy Spirit empowers the Christian life and gives us discernment on how to navigate the good, the bad, and the ugly. Paul says this in Romans 5, 1 in closing, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Let's pray.